Well, here we are again, Eustacia and myself, Chris Curry, and we are going to uh, talk about mirror neurons and autism today. And we're going to start out with a reading by Eustacia, and then we will have our discussion. And at the end of the discussion, we'll have some information on how you can get this uh, reading printed, and you also can uh, email Eustacia personally. So thank you, Eustacia, for doing these wonderful readings. I just love doing them with you and I guess we're ready to go. My pleasure too and here we go. I'm going to put on glasses because I'll read better if I can see better. When we try to define what we mean by sympathy, we come up with phrases like awareness of somebody else's pain or joy and then we sigh. Our words sound stuffy. We look to Shakespeare for better words. Shakespeare gives us a riddle about fancy. Well, fancy is a word that's equally hard to nail down. Webster calls it a liking formed by caprice. Well, there's another tricky word. Then Webster defines caprice. He calls it an abrupt change in feeling. Ah. That explanation has a good ring to it. So with Webster's thought, here goes Shakespeare's riddle. Tell me where is fancy bred? Or in the heart? Or in the head? How begot? How nourished? Reply. Reply. <sighs> when it comes to replying, We've always had a gut feeling that fantasy is not forgot in the head. If not, then where is it forgot? In the heart? Well, how could the heart muscle, basically a pump to keep our blood circulating, how could it be responsible for emotional sensations like my heart sank, my blood ran cold, Shakespeare's two choices don't quite fit. In 1994, bioneurologist Antonio Damasio gave us a partial clue. He said, we're not thinking beings who feel, we are feeling beings who think. The mind is in the service of the body. Well, that's okay, but we're still baffled. Then, in 1996, neuroscientist Giacomo Brezzolati of the University of Parma, Italy, came forward with a neurological phenomenon so amazing, it took him and his colleagues several years to believe what they had stumbled upon. It all came about like this. In Dr. Rizzolatti's lab, there was a monkey that we had been wired up in with implants in areas of its brain used for planning and carrying out physical movements. It was a hot afternoon in Parma and the student came into the lab licking an ice cream cone. Suddenly, the monkey's wires let out a burr the sound the wires made when the monkey actually licked an ice cream cone. The student licked again. Once again, the wires let out a brrrr. Though the monkey didn't move, what was watching had activated the neurological brain area used for planning and carrying out physical movements. There, for the world to see was evidence of a neurological system nobody had ever before witnessed or even imagined. Neurons that mimic the physical action of another being. The Palmer lab named them mirror neurons. The first question that discovery stirred up was what about us? Do we have mirror neurons? The answer, of course, is yes. According to Dr. Rizzolatti, quote, 
Mirror neurons allow us to grasp the minds of others, not through conceptual reasoning, but through direct stimulation by feeling, not by thinking. The human brain has multiple mirror neuron systems that specialize in carrying out an understanding, not just the actions of others, but their intentions, the social meaning of their behavior and emotions. End of quote. That could include empathy, the old weird sinking feeling every mother experiences when rushing a bleeding child to the emergency room while battling her own queasiness. The question has been with us for eons. This binds us together, holds us viscerally responsible for each other. Despite Rizzolatti's compelling evidence, both scientific and traditional wills have been wary. As the New York Times Science article noted back in 1996, the idea of mirror neuron action was shaking up other disciplines than science. Again, a quote, shifting our understanding of culture, empathy, philosophy, language, imitation, autism, and psychotherapy. Yes, autism is included. Again, I quote the Times. While many people with autism can identify an emotional expression, they do not feel the emotional significance from observing other people. This is by uh, a neuroscientist out of UCLA. Now I go on with what the Times said. Everyday experiences are also being viewed in a new light. How children learn, why people respond to certain types of sports, why watching media violence may be harmful. With this explosion of unforeseen information, it's not surprising that traditional disciplines are still approaching mirror neurons if they were neurological mavericks that had leapt the fence and are roaming loose among the brambles of alchemy, chiromancy, astrology, and superstition, adding to the social confusion of traditional science is the very real probable pro problem of provable systemized research. We cannot wire up a human brain as we can a monkey's. These two pitfalls render precise neuron, neuron research difficult to establish and even more difficult to fund. But it doesn't explain why details on mirror neurons are missing from the pages of top authority books on autism. Thus far, only the work of V.S. Ramachandran. Is there any reference to mirror neurons? And I don't know why. Meantime, I hope somebody gave an ice cream cone to Dr. Rizzolatti's monkey. He sure earned it. Well, that is a, a cute ending to a very serious uh, topic, mirror neurons. So um, I had a couple of questions. I wanted to kind of go back to your first phrase there that you used right in the beginning, if I can go back and find that, um, and ask you to explain that a little bit more, because this one, a little bit more on the Merchant of Venice. Tell me where is fancy bread in or in the heart or in the head? How begot, how nourished? Kind of give us a little, put that in... Uh, less Shakespeare and a little more well I think exactly what, what, what that Shakespeare means is asking is is it mental or is it emotional okay and I think this is uh, where mirror neurons do fit in they they uh, they are about feeling right so yes, in that do. sense Shakespeare's right and and even in in the latest language they don't even say I love that now they just say I heart that because that's the 
the little picture of the heart used all the time. So people go, oh, I heart that. So yes, the heart has become the symbol for something. The symbol of that. Well, even here emotion. in New York, the sign for I love New York is always done I, then a heart. New right. York. I heart I New York. I thought about so, that, but it's yeah. true. We, we so the language is changing too to go along with that some to go symbolism. Along with it. So when you first thought about the mirror neurons and autism, what first came into your mind as far as people with autism and how they're reacting to? Well, um, I, I began to, to think neurons. about uh, different, first place, I think there is a lack of connection. They, they have a lot of emotion about themselves, but they don't recognize emotion in other people. And we recognize it through a kind of mirror neuron response. We, we do look at each other and understand without talking about it. We feel for each other. And the best example I can think of is uh, the dip difference between sympathy and uh, empathy. Sympathy is, is a head thing, is a mental response. You see a man in the street with only one leg and you think it would be really hard to have only one leg. But if you are a man in battle and you have seen your buddy's leg shot off and you cannot get the image out of you, that's, that's mirror neurons. Because you would feel that excruciating because you pain. you feel it yourself. And I think that's part of what post-traumatic stress disorder is about, is they cannot rid themselves of the horror of what they have felt. Right. Not so a, lot, a lot of times people with autism, we, we, we think it might be better that they don't have all these emotional reactions to things that they see. It's often said, well, well they're, they're much more logical and so they can solve problems of the world with a, a, a less emotional involvement. How do you feel about that? I mean, that's well, kind of the mirror neuron thing. You see someone sad and then you react to it, but nothing I changes. I think they long to join. What, as you say that, what comes to my mind is what a young boy, see, I think part of the problem with autism is they have some of the mirror neuron, but all not all of it. And, and as Dr. Rizzolotti has indicated, it's an elaborate, uh, neuron system that we don't really know with many different aspects to it. So sometimes you have those, in this case, it was a teenage boy. He had a, some sense that something was going on and his words to Dr. Ami Klin were, the other boys have a language and I don't understand it. He wanted to understand that language. He saw that something was going on and he didn't know what it was because it wasn't there in his neurons. And I think Ami Klin told that story because of his own mirror neurons were, were in great um, sympathy of this boy. He wanted to know how to give him that. And so do you think it's going to be possible to give people with autism that that emotional connection or what do we do about that? Because it's is it a disconnect? Is it a missing in I, your I mind? It is a disconnect in some way. I think we're everything is connected together for starting. So we're social creatures. We're incomplete without each other. I think there's a connection through music. And again, I, I began thinking about this after we decided we wanted to talk about it, and incidences came back into my mind. Uh, I think of two, and they happened at, uh, at two events that you had planned for, the, where we were a whole families together for a weekend. And in this case, uh, there was a karaoke machine, and the other kids were singing to it. And as I looked at it, I was standing out in the hall, I saw this little boy walking back and forth with his fingers in his ear, back and forth, back and forth. Obviously, the, the sound was more than he could manage. I thought, why doesn't somebody in his family take him away to a place that's quieter? Then I saw what was happening. 
After a moment, the little boy nodded, and from the side came his father. His father put the boy up on his shoulder, and together they went up to join the karaoke. The little boy wanted to be part of that. The music had stirred him. He couldn't quite manage the sound of it all. So he, he had to work hard to overcome his distress at the, at the noise, which was warring with his instinct of loving it and wanting to join it. Um, so I, yeah, I wonder what would happen if we'd put an electrodes like they did with the monkey. They put the electrodes on there, and, and I think that's such a cute story with the monkey getting excited because he wants ice cream. But what would happen if we could do that with people so we could say, oh, they're, they really, they're getting excited about the music, but there's this other thing happening too, which is not allowing them, you know, the distress. Well, see, the they have two things was, going on at once. The monkey just wanted ice cream. He was happy. Well, yeah, but, that was a know. quick, quick response. Also, he was seriously wired, driven through his skull. Right. Yeah, we can't and, do that and, to people. As yet, they may be able to. Uh, no, we don't. We don't <laughs> drill holes in people's skull. Uh, and, but we may figure out another way to get that image to find out find out how that connects but i suspect that dr rizzolati is right there there are various different ways this connection connects and it, and it is part of of uh, what makes us empath it, you, you you see it's a way that we take visceral responsibility for each other i think we've always had them it helps hold uh, families together, tribes together, and we are tribal creatures as well as social creatures. So and we, we care about we, each other because we, and I think we, we feel their like, pain. You know, we talk yeah. about that. I feel your pain. We actually yeah. do feel their pain. It's, and it's we very actually real. do feel it. It's very real. So. And I wish, I'm hoping we can get over this struggle to figure out how to uh, understand it in a more organized fashion. Because this is very hard. I mean, good research depends upon uh, organized information. This does not lend itself to that kind of a system. No. But, and something you said I think is really important with dealing with children with autism about the little boy, and I don't know what his disability was, but if probably was autism, you know, he couldn't deal with the sound, but yes. he did want to join the group. And I think so many times children with autism are not given those opportunities to join groups because the parents will go, oh, they'll get overstimulated. They don't like transition. They don't want to be around other people. They prefer to be by themselves. And I don't know if that's true. That's not true. I don't true. think that's true. I think, I think they are, are, their ears are sensitive just as their skin is sensitive. That the, and that's what this little boy was trying to overcome. And the, the other story, music story that I think of, that I think I've told you before, but I'll tell it again. And, and that was the little boy who did definitely have autism and he was mute. He was about five years old. He never made a sound of any kind. But again, there was a karaoke machine, which is a great, great gadget. So it's a lot in families together. together. <laughs> they love it. They just love it. Well, he watched, he listened, and all of a sudden, he ran up there. He grabbed the mic from the other kid, and instead of singing a song, he said, uh. so he, was he was beginning to talk, and I thought, if we could just get his mirror neurons going, he will talk. Yes. And the music is what's turning him on. It's what's connecting to him viscerally. So they, so, and I think that's a very important thing to let parents know that just because the sensory integration is causing a child to act like they don't want to be part of the group, the other part of us, the mirror neurons that, that uh, um, get caught up in the joy of some event that's going on are still there and very much. And, and then I think you probably have the meltdowns and children getting very frustrated because there's that conflict within them yeah. that I yeah. want to do it, I want to be part of this, and yet it's so painful to get my, you know, get over the parts well, of like me that, that can't do it. like that little boy walking back and forth with his fingers in his right. ears, uh, torn between 
the pain it was causing him and his wanting to be part of it. So, so I, I always like to bring things back to Temple since that's, you know, something people are interested in and, and you firsthand with that, that example. But when she was younger, were there, there painful things that she had to get over because she would see the other children doing something and, and wanted to be part of it? Would it, did she overcome some of her own? Yes, and she, uh, she wanted, she wanted to be part of the group. She wanted to play with the other kids. And as she's always said, I had to learn to play the games by their rules or they wouldn't let me play with them. And one of the things she's pointed out to me lately, which I hadn't really thought about it, she said, all the games that existed in the 50s, it had to be played with somebody else. They were all variations of the old game of Parcheesi. that involved dice and uh, a little token. You move from square to square, and the square told you what to do. It could be to your advantage or your disadvantage. And then there was a final goal you got to in the center of the game. Those games couldn't be played alone. They only worked when you did it with somebody else. Right. And I think that one of the troubling points about the games on on the internet are the computers and videos computer, computer games videos they're alone yes they're not something you do with somebody else but i think people get that same reaction from the mirror neurons but they don't have to deal with all the sensory real sensory stuff they can actually just be getting that and, and you have talked about that like men watching football games <clears throat> I don't know why we just let men watch football games, but anyone watching a football game, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. So they would be, but you get, you're not in the crowd, you're, you're sitting in your living room, but you can get the same feelings of, you know, crashing into someone else as you're watching it happen. But I, I also, think, yeah. I, I take note of the fact that men like to watch it with somebody else. They will yes. all get together with beer and popcorn and plunk down on the sofa and watch together but they children are quite them. satisfied children with autism with just being by themselves with the video and i think that's a concern of yours and it and temples big, both of yes, you very i'm very concerned about that because uh, it it's it isolates them and i also feel that a lot of these kids have low muscle tone and it it, they sit there in front of a computer when they should be having to get up and move and make a connection to somebody. It eliminates all that. I, I, I go back to the time when we didn't have uh, the computers we have today. And the little classes where they were teaching kids, they had a little Velcro board and they had pictures the kid could stick on the Velcro board for things that they wanted if they couldn't talk. And I liked how the teacher handled it. The little boy that I watched, he wanted a drink of juice. He saw that other people had it. He has to get up out of his desk. He has to move for starters, come up to the teach. He has to go to where all the little pictures are. He has to find a picture of the juice and stick it on his Velcro board. Then he has to walk up to the teacher and the teacher told me afterwards, she said, I always say the words and make him listen to them. I say, oh, you want juice? She said, I wait and make him nod, nods. Then she said, I'll say, is that all you want? Well, the little boy looked around the room and sees other people have crackers. He'd like some. He's got to go back to those pictures, to find the little picture of crackers and stick that on his Velcro board. And once again, bring it up to the teacher. And she says, oh, you want crackers with your juice? Yes, he nods. Now, when you look at that, you see she, he's had to connect to the teacher. He's had to actually physically move his body. He cannot sit there without moving, which is also important. He will think better with motion. We all do. We're kinetic creatures, and a little mm -hmm. kinetic action gets the brain stirred up. We've all had the experience of having a good idea when we went out for a walk. We weren't thinking about it at all, but suddenly the idea 
pops into our head. It's caused by kinetic action. Right. And I, I would like to see us, I'm not against the iPhone, I just want to see us use, a, use it in a better way. Understand the series of things that teacher did back then, and that was in the 60s, and see if we can't copy it. Well, and I think you said something that I feel is maybe even more significant than he, him going up and asking for the juice is he saw that everyone else had juice. I think, and that speaks to keeping children with autism in an environment where things are happening. Children are are getting juice. They're getting their coats on. They're do everything that they're doing. He's watching, and then he wants it. Which we're back to the mirror neurons. He sees them drinking juice, and he thought, "Oh, that looks. I think I would like to have that. I would get thirsty too." When and we he tend to do, and he sees the crackers. Yes, but I, I think it involved yeah. effort. It involved, yes. you're right, it involved a connection to the other kids. I hadn't thought of that. And that's, and we lose that too when we show them, uh, when we isolate children, we teach them to use their communication boards and everything is on there. Or there might be a child, a picture of a child drinking or a video of a child drinking something, which might give you the same mirror neuron response. But there's something missing when you don't, you're not watching an actual person do it. Like, oh, that guy's got a drink. I want yes. one too. And, and that's why I, I, I like worry that so much made, about that. Yeah, because the teacher, she said, I make him hear the words. Right. And then so she follows it. through with that. But I think yeah. he was obviously in an environment where everyone was getting a drink. And it's very, when you see, and they're drinking it and they're enjoying it, and you say, whoa. I want to feel that feeling too. Like that too. Yes. yes. And and Temple was always in schools with other children and also in a family with other children too. You had three other children that she was managing to was, deal with. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. And there were a lot of children in the neighborhood. We spawned the baby boom. Yes. So were, so, and uh, and, and, and your children went out children. to play and had and Temple went with them. So a yeah. lot of the things that you I think are important to you with mirror neurons is you saw that as Temple learned got a yeah. chance to maybe develop that and, and maybe it is possible to uh, develop the mirror neurons if you can overcome some of the autism that's making you not want to be around people. Or that's makes yeah, it too yeah, overstimulating. Like that, Maybe that it is different. Old kid, it stirred the, the karaoke stirred up something in him, in both those kids, and they were both pretty severely autistic. Yeah. But they wanted to be part of the group. They wanted right. to participate. They could see well, and they saw everybody else having. They wanted that feeling. Everyone else is having fun. I want to feel it too. Yeah. And I can't feel it. Or it's not the same, you know, I'm watching it, but it's not the same. And I do think a lot of stuff you talk about Temple with her growing up um, where she wanted to be part of the group, but there was a group to be part of. Yes. And that group was fun. Yes. And maybe it's not so much the mirror neurons didn't develop or they're not there. Maybe you just can't reach them because they have to get through all the autistic garbage. You know the sensory and the the sensitivity and the uh, the slow processing and all the other things that go along with autism. You never get a chance to, to like that boy. Up you on know. That response. Yes. Like yes. The boy. But yeah. Uh, so it might be more. Maybe they are there, or maybe they're not. I don't well, know. We, we don't, don't know. and we'd love to and have I that think, research. I, I think Ripsalati said in in one of his quotes there that it's a much more or uh, more complicated system than we have realized. Yes. Uh, it, it it's not going to go by one particular route. I I think this is also part of the problem with autism. We don't know where it originates. It looks as though it could originate in. In inheritance, it looks as though it could originate in um, premature birth. You know, children who are preemies are more likely. Or children that are neglected. We see a lot of children, children who are yeah. neglected the first couple of neglected. years of their lives have a so, lot of autistic behaviors. So, so. There, are, there are things missing because they haven't developed them. Right. And. We can 
we can help quicken that response. Yes, I think we can. I think you and and it continues to develop because you've said even now Temple is showing more and more uh, of wanting to do what other well she's always wanted to be um, successful and she always wanted to be known yeah. and she she knew that was a cool thing you know she liked the feeling of somebody knowing her well hi temple she liked that yes she so, liked that. well i think and that's very early i told you about the time when they i got uh temple and her sister to draw the lucky number for that uh, was coming for a raffle that was it, this was in an intermission in the show and she liked the sensation they both did Yes. of walking up there, up the steps, up onto the stage while everybody applauded and they were wearing their best clothes <laughs> and the spotlight followed them. It was kind of fun. It was kind yes. of neat. And, and they were suddenly aware of what it is to be part of a group. Right. And, and, they, and, and to overcome whatever Temple may have had for uh, hesitation about doing it, she would plow through it because she wanted that feeling she so wanted, and she carried that off perfectly she wanted it yeah. like, like the little boy that had to figure out his ears first but he then he right. wanted it and his father right. knew that that's what i loved was the father didn't press him he didn't didn't say you've got to do it he just waited and Wait he didn't protect him from it he didn't come and, and didn't tell us him. you need to make everything quiet he can't handle no, he the didn't. noise he, he just said Let's, he, you can you want this let's make it happen you want this, yeah and he didn't press he just waited there until well we I think your it. your main goal here is to get more research on mirror neurons yes because it is. you see that it's, I think and we, that's I, something I believe that deeply uh, we don't know we must look for different uh, as we would you and I were talking earlier to look for different synapses. It may mm -hmm. not be in the actual gene. It may be in the way the genes connect. Right. I, more and more, I feel we are creatures who connect with each other. And when you look at the world, the whole world is connected in different ways. Yes. Uh, I, I keep going back to the fact that the, the whole globe is a huge magnet. And I love the fact that when Newton saw the apple fall, it wasn't just that he saw the apple fall. He saw the ground leap up to meet it. Right. It was, it was and the that's force a, of connection. And, and I think that is probably a great ending statement because not only do we want our children to enter the world, but we want the world to rise up and meet them. Yes. We want both those things to happen for yes, all the do. children we're working with. Yes, we do. So I think this, is, this has really been informative if we can uh, you know, encourage people to do more research on this because we obviously had no answers, but lots of questions, lots of stories. Uh, no and, answers. But no answers on this no one. Answers. So hopefully we'll wait for the scientists are, who are going to start calling us and saying, but when do we have the answers? We have the answers. We'll go, yeah. good. Let's get you on here and talk with us about them. Yes, we'll try to do that. Uh, okay, so our next, um, we'll have another topic in a couple of weeks. Um, and I think we were going to do something on hope and yeah. uh, living with hope and, and keeping hope alive and, and a, re a reality based hope. I think that was kind of what yes. we were going to talk about. Yes. But thank you very much for and uh, it's great. I love talking to you. We had a wonderful thank you. time. I too. I think and we'll just keep exploring. We will keep exploring and we will That's, do this again. Yes. So, thanks, Eustacia. Well, thank you.